Welcome to the inquiry room. I guess we'll call this uh, the inquiry response, maybe. Uh, this is the first time we've gone on video. I've been talking to Jeremy about doing the podcast in video format. Uh, I think he's good with that. I just hadn't worked on setting it all up yet. So we will see. We might do that in the future. But what we're doing here is we're going to respond to someone who commented on our conversation that we had with our sister, uh, Temperance, about growing up in the Mormon religion. And, you know, a young man commented quite a few comments on the on the YouTube platform where that was posted. And we're just going to look at what he said and um, just walk through it and compare it to the scriptures and compare it to um, Orthodox Christian doctrine. And just really highlight the, the key distinctions more. Um, I think he's kind of trying to downplay the 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 differences, but ultimately there are differences, and we will we will get into that. So the first comment uh, from Jonathan. First of all, Jonathan, I appreciate you commenting, and I appreciate you listening to the episode. Uh, I hate that it didn't have immediate fruit um, in us talking about the beauty of the gospel uh the freedom in the in the gospel uh i see that you uh, based on these comments still think that there's freedom in the message of the mormon religion and hopefully i can i can try to shed more light on the fact that it is out of step with the true gospel as delivered um shoot from the prophets of old all the way through Christ's ministry, John the Baptist's ministry, Christ's ministry, and Christ's apostles establishing the church. I, I do want to say, and this is just, this is not taking a shot at anybody. It's just, I'm just going to make this point that um, well, I won't do that. So, so, without any more delay, we'll get right into Jonathan's comments here, and we'll walk through, uh, walk through them. First, uh, first thing he says he's basing this on on timestamp twelve twenty, and this is right about the time where we uh, Temperance, our sister, was talking about the hope she found in the true gospel. And so, Jonathan says there must have been some severe misunderstanding of the doctrines of the church. Uh, of Jesus Christ Latter Day Saints, uh, I, I I'm not I'm going to try not to call them a church because I've been kind of convicted of that. The church, the the word for church is ecclesia, which uh, in the original translation, especially in the, if you use that back in the Septuagint, going back to the Old Testament, it also refers to the gathering of the assembly or the assembly of God's people. If I don't think that this religion is God's people, I can't in good conscience call them a church. So it's not to be derogatory. It's not to take a shot at them. It's, it's simply a conscience thing for myself. It's, to me, it's blasphemous to refer to them as a church. So I will try to refrain from that, although I did slip right there. and That's the official title of their religion. So LDS, uh, he says it's uh, misunderstanding the doctrines of LDS to say that there's no hope and that it's all work. Uh, the plan of salvation is the most hope-filled doctrine that I know of on earth. Because of the grace of Jesus Christ, all people who are born into this world are of infinite worth and will have a chance to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ in the spirit world before the, resur before the resurrection and after the resurrection. Contrast that with the evangelical teachings, which vary wildly, but fundamentally teach that if you haven't heard the gospel, you're doomed to eternal torment in hell. And in some other groups of mainstream Christianity, they teach that babies aren't baptized, who aren't baptized, are also doomed to eternal torment in hell because of original sin. 
the church of, oh, there we go again. The LDS doesn't teach that we are saved by our works. We teach that we are saved only by the merits and atonement of Jesus Christ, our Savior, anything slash anyone that says otherwise is either lying or doesn't understand the doctrine. Okay, so um, a few things to deal with here. So if you look at this statement that, first of all, the, the gospel of Jesus is where all the hope is. And the plan of salvation, he says, the plan of salvation is the most hope-filled doctrine. It is, depending on what that means. But actually, if you look at this and you really, really consider it, you reason through it, and and I've actually just now really kind of realized this, the the Mormon uh, doctrine of salvation is really kind of universal. And Temperance actually laid that out when she said, you, you have to really deny, you have to actually experience Christ directly, like see him, whether it's a... a, a a later up in appearance now or, or when he was walking the earth, uh, that you deny him from that. Well, that would be the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, I assume, which Jesus mentions. I, I would assume that's where that comes from. I could be wrong. But point being that, like she pointed out, and he's kind of saying it here as well, is that that's the only way that you're not technically saved. So they can say that you're saved if you go to any of the three heavens. You just don't get full, full exaltation, uh, glorification, and exaltation unless you do all the ordinances. So it's actually a, a bit of a universalism if you think about it. So uh, that's just out of orthodox already, <laughs> to be you know to be honest. But and that's actually evident here when he says that because of the grace of Jesus Christ all people who are born into the world into this world are of infinite worth and um i think that's that's a high view of man and a low view of god to say that we're of infinite worth um we're made in God's image, so there, there's value and worth there because God created us and we're made in His image. But the only thing that's of infinite worth is God. Yeah, I just can't in good conscience say anything other. So that's a, a kind of a, a low view God of low view of God, high view of man situation, just to be honest with you, Jonathan. And then uh, and it says, because of that, or Following that, and we'll have a chance to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ in the spirit world before the resurrection and after the resurrection. Um, this also assumes that we're owed a chance to receive the gospel. <laughs> that we're receiving the gospel is not an obligatory to God. He he's not obligated to share the gospel with anybody. At all, if if no one was saved from their place before God, which every person out, save Christ outside of Christ, not counting Christ, is condemned before God. Jesus said, "I didn't come to condemn the world; the world stands condemned already." No one is owed a chance to be saved. We have to understand that. And if you if you don't, then it leads you to these doctrines. And this is not just a, a problem with LDS. This is a problem in evangelical Christianity. People walk around thinking they're owed a chance to be saved. And that's just simply not true. If God saved nobody, he would still be just. He'd be just. And the only and, and Here's the thing to really understand. The only reason he's just and saves people is because Christ fulfilled the righteousness on their behalf and paid their, their sin debt. If Christ had not have done that work, he would be, he would not be just to save anybody. That's what Romans 3 tells us. That because he, in his forbearance, passed over former sins, is what Romans 3 says. The propitiation of Christ is to show God's righteousness, His justice, His His 
justness. Um, because otherwise he would have been unjust and unrighteous if he just passed over sins. That's what Paul's telling us there in Romans 3. So we, we're, nobody's owed a chance. So that's the, that's the you, if you start on the, the, if you start in the assumption that we're owed a chance, then you're already starting out on the wrong playing field. So he says, uh, contrast that with evangelical. I just laid out the evangelical view, the, the Orthodox Christian view of God and his relation to salvation and justice and the fact that he salvation in a, you receiving the gospel is not obligatory. He's not a, he's not obligated to do any of that. It's all by grace, and that that's what makes it even greater. That's not people shouldn't be discouraged by that. That sh, that sh, should show us his how gracious he is. That he is not obligated to do that. To save his enemies, but he does it anyway. It that should be comforting, and that should magnify his goodness and his glory, and it does for so many that that truly understand it. So he's saying that the LDS doesn't teach they're saved by works. Yeah, but the, that's because you have kind of a universal salvation, but you're not. You don't get the heaven. The Orthodox Christian heaven is that you get the presence of God. Every the, Jesus says the least, the least in heaven is greater than the most righteous that ever walked the earth. Which he says actually in, in Matthew 11, I think, is John the Baptist. Maybe Matthew 10, Matthew 11 maybe. Anyway, he, he says the most righteous man ever born a woman is John the Baptist, and the least in heaven is greater than he. So what he's saying is, you get what you get what the most righteous person, you get his stance with God, Christ's stance, not John the Baptist's stance, Christ's stance, which is full blessing, full glory in his presence. The least, so there's not a lower heaven that's not, that's still kind of separated from God. And there's not a middle heaven that's maybe a little bit closer. And then there's upper heaven, upper heaven that you have to work to get to. That's the big difference right there. That's the big difference. So yeah, you can say that they're saved because they're not in hell. I guess, Jonathan, I guess you could say that. But that's not, that's not the same thing as the Orthodox Christian doctrine of heaven and hell and salvation. The Orthodox Christian doctrine is that you are, you are, as Romans eight twenty eight, uh, but um, it's laid out before Romans eight twenty eight in the golden chain. You are foreknown. You are called. You are justified. You're sanctified and glorified. So all saints are glorified, not the ones who, uh, who completed all the ordinances and did all the temple work. No, all saints including the thief on the cross who, who said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said, you will be with me in paradise. Even him is glorified on the new earth and in heaven. So he says, next comment, further to uh, his previous comment on the fact that we'll be preaching the gospel in the spirit world, as well as the resurrection, the implication here is that in the celestial kingdom, the glory of glory, there will be a lot of people who weren't members of the LDS. Jonathan, this actually uh, completely contradicts Hebrews 9.27, where it says that it's appointed man wants to die and then comes judgment. And it's not given a distinction of, of some period to repent. Or hear the gospel in between. It says you die and then comes judgment. So w the Bible actually is pretty clear that, that your chance for repentance is, is now. Okay. In your, in your first physical life. So. Um, 
again, this is a man-centered thing that you're owed that you're owed a uh, chance to to be saved, and God owes us nothing. Everything He gives us is grace. We, he, he gives us grace and mercy, and we're not owed either one of those. The only thing he owes us is justice, actually. He does owe us something. He owes us judgment. And uh, by grace and mercy, we are able to not receive that. And not everybody receives that grace and mercy because not everybody turns to Christ completely. So if grace hasn't been taught in her growing up, this is the next one on. She's talking about how when she came to the true understanding of the gospel of Christ, that it was grace, 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 grace. The gospel is grace. And he says, if grace wasn't taught, it was worse teachers imaginable, nothing of the church. Oh, sorry, nothing of the LDS is possible without Christ's grace. It, Jonathan, it just means what you, it just depends on what you mean by grace. So. Just depends on what you mean by grace. And I've already demonstrated that your grace that you're talking about is not the grace that's given in the scriptures. And particularly, like I said, in the letter to the Romans, eight, uh, chapter 8, the golden chain there, the, the culmination of that grace is that you are actually in, in the earlier parts of chapter 8 when Christ says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And you are adopted co-heirs with Christ and Christ is so if you're co-heirs you're co-heirs to what you're co-heirs to Christ's kingdom given to him by the father that's, that's beautiful but you don't that's not according to doing ordinances that's the least the least the least in the kingdom of heaven is also co-heir okay uh next comment he lists um free gifts that uh, he didn't I'm not exactly sure. I guess he's uh, just expounding on that. It's, he's referring to 1808 timestamp, but we'll go to the next one. He says that the Bible does not teach that the earth is our final destination when Christ comes again. He says Christ taught that the destination of the faithful would be in eternal glory with the Father. Yeah, it will be in the eternal glory of the Father, but the Father comes down. The, the the new Jerusalem comes down. God purifies the earth with fire, and the new Jerusalem comes down. This is, Jonathan, this is in uh, Isaiah 65, 17, Isaiah 66, 22, uh, 2 Peter 3, 13, Revelation 21, 1. In other places, that's specifically about the new earth, the new Jerusalem. But other places where it's evident that God comes down to us, we don't go up to God. So we, He will come. He will in the garden. He He created the earth and He dwelled with uh, as He chose. And the garden was His tabernacle, just like the temple, the tabernacle of the wilderness was built to emulate the garden, and it was where He dwelled. And the temple was the same, and. And Jesus tabernacled with us. He came down as Jesus. And the new earth will be that ultimate final tabernacle thanks to the work and the fulfillment of Christ Jesus. Now, um, we see that uh, in other places, Christ or God comes down uh, consistently. So as he comes down in the garden. He comes down to Abraham in, in the form of messenger. He comes down to Jacob, wrestles with him, changes his name, regenerates him, I, I would argue. He comes uh, down in Christ, and he always comes to us. We don't ascend to him. And, and remember what happened when we tried to ascend to him in the Tower of Babel. <laughs> He, he he's put it put a stop to it right and that's that's one of our fallacies is trying to ascend to god and and the jacob's ladder is not for us to climb jacob's ladder is for god to ascend the angels ascending and descending that's and christ is the ladder to where heaven comes down but yes we we do dwell in 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 his glory in the presence of his glory it's amazing 
But he does ultimately come down and he renews the earth at fire. And we, and we live, those who are in Christ, those who are co-heirs to this kingdom. The kingdom is an earthly kingdom. It's renewed earth. It's, it's back to the original design before we uh, corrupted it with the fall before Adam and Eve corrupted it, and we partook in that, in our own corruptions of it. When God reveals, this is a time step 23, 19, when God reveals or restores knowledge, it doesn't mean that God is changing. It means He's guiding His people to more truths that will help us in this life and in this in the eternities to come, un- uh, in the eternities come unto Christ. For example, my, Matthew nineteen eighteen, when the Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus, Jesus corrected them on the law. Okay, so this is where we were saying that they con- they uh, have an immutable, have a mutable, not immutable, but a mutable God because of their prophets and apostles, so called, continuing, and he's trying to make the case that they're doing what Jesus did, that they're Pro, their so-called prophets and apostles are uh, not changing what God has said. They're correcting you know, past misunderstandings of people on what true Christianity is and what God's revelation really is. The fact, Jonathan, is that you have one of two things going on. You either have God changing Okay, or you have God, uh, well, three things. God's either changing or he's contradicting himself, which he does not do. So, but that's one of your, that's one of the outcomes of what you're saying here. Or that your prophets are false prophets. That's the only three options. No middle ground. So either, either he's changing He's contradicting himself or your prophets are contradicting in their false prophets because your prophets have had multiple, multiple false prophecies, one. But but on top of that, they have contradicted themselves because now, like, for example, Brigham Young had said that uh, it was 1875 or 77 or something like that, that every every thing he's ever preached is scripture well he preached that uh, polygamy was was the law of the land in 1855 well that's not you you guys don't hold to that anymore do you so you have prophets since then supposedly who have said no that it's not polygamy well that's a contradiction that's just one example but you also, the, the bigger problem is not contradicting yourself, but contradicting the scriptures. And we've already pointed out some of those contradictions. So you either have a changing God, which actually is the best case scenario for you. you you're better to be an open theist than to be uh, uh, having a mutable God and, and, and uh, a God that is immutable, but actually cha- uh, is contradictory, which is incoherent. The fact of God being contradictory is not even possible. So, um, or you have false prophets. So it's only it's only one of those, Jonathan. I'm uh, that's just that. I don't know another way to put it. There's no positive outcome for you in this. So either your God is changing, okay, or you have false prophets. Because God can't be, I'm not going to give you, I'm not even going to give you the option that God contradicted himself. Your prophets have to be the one that contradict themselves. I'm, I'm so that's the options. You either have a God that changes or your prophets are false. There's no other way. The prophets in the scriptures don't, none of them ever contradicted God or themselves. In the Old Testament, or the apostles of the New Testament, not once. So, I don't know what else to tell you on that one. But, and and Jesus didn't contradict 
Jesus didn't contradict the law and the prophets when he corrected the scribes and Pharisees. And and Joseph Smith and your the the Mormon apostles and prophets supposedly uh, so called they have contradicted the scriptures and themselves multiple times. So he says maybe uh, he says maybe it's better if you properly educate yourself on our beliefs as illustrated by my comments so far before making that judgment. The judgment that basically the judgment that we believe it's the false religion is what he's talking about. Um, 2620. And that's when I was trying to be gracious and say, look, let's not, you know, let's just appeal to them. Let's not throw stones. But my response is just that uh, I, we, we know enough to, to know that you're in severe and heretical error. And, uh, and you don't need to know, uh, you don't need to know everything about the faults, the counterfeit to know that it's a counterfeit. You just need to know the true thing well, and the counterfeit will stand out to you. You know, a lot of apologists have used this analogy with uh, being able to tell counterfeit money. You don't handle fa counterfeit money to learn how to find counterfeit money. You handle so much true, real money that the counterfeits just stand out to you. So when you know the script, when you know the gospel well, and you steep in it every single day, and you uh join with brothers and sisters and and consider it and just dwell in it then counterfeit gospels pop out really really broad really strongly so anyway uh next one here he says uh he's got some bullet points here one two and three number one so see so he says several things to correct here in this statement. Who do you think created the devil? Okay, we were talking about Jesus not being created. He says, who do you think created the devil? Um, and so, well, God created the devil. More specifically, the Son. The Son of the Trinity created all things. Colossians 1, 14 through 20. John 1, 5, uh, 1, 1, through, 1 through 5 and 1, 14. So John 1 through... <laughs> John 1, 1... In the beginning was the Word, and words with God, and Word was God. He was with God. Uh, anyway, uh, he all things were through him was all things created. Not not anything was created. Anyway, all things were created through him. <laughs> you know the thing. <laughs> um, and then John one fourteen, he the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's confirming that's Jesus. And he, uh, the only God, has as the image of the true God, uh, verse eighteen, paraphrasing. So, Colossians one, he holds out all things together. All, uh, and Hebrews, I don't remember what what chapter, but anyway, so Jesus created the devil actually. So he didn't create his brother. <laughs> so, uh. This is a big one. Jesus is the only begotten of the Father. What do you think this means besides that God, uh, the Father, created Jesus Christ? Um, well, are you talking about the Son of the Trinity? Or are you talking about the, uh, the man Jesus? Uh, the man Jesus was born um, to a woman conceived by the Holy Spirit. But he was not, but the son of the Trinity, which was the, you know, I don't know, Jonathan, if you have an understanding of the hypostatic union, I don't know the Mormon view on that. I would be afraid to find out, to be honest with you. Jesus was truly man, truly God. He, he had a divine nature. He had a human nature. And uh, bottom line is this, begotten is what you're talking about here. You said, what else does begotten mean than created? Well, begotten doesn't mean created. Created means created. Begotten means uh, to bring forth in your uh, substance uh, of your own makeup. Okay, so when you create, you actually create something other than you. 
So God created. He didn't create another God. He, he can't, actually, another God can't be created. Then if God could create another God, he's not God because God truly in nature, God has to be one, self-existent, eternal being. Uh, it, you know, logically, it just can't work another way, to be honest with you. But uh, begotten means that uh, you're, it's brought forth out of the same substance. So I could have a son and begot, beget a son. And I didn't create that son. God actually created that son. Actually. But he is of my substance. He is of my DNA. He is, he is of the same substance as me. And in uh, nature, we're, we're equal. So the son of the Trinity, begotten by the father of the Trinity, is of the same substance of the father. This is why when, when he said he was the son of God and he spoke to as God as his father, this is why the Pharisees wanted to stone him. Because he was saying that he was divine. They wanted to stone him for blasphemy. And that's actually what he got crucified for, was blasphemy. So our, our, actually, our, our big dilemma is, do we, do we believe Jesus was a blasphemer? If we don't believe he was a blasphemer, we believe he was Christ, and we trust that he's, he atoned for our, our transgressions against God. That's, uh, that's our salvation. But otherwise, if we, we think he was, uh, if we think he was blaspheming, then we're blaspheming the Holy Spirit. So, begotten is actually, when it says that Christ was begotten, it's a claim that the Bible's making, that he was divine. So that's what that means, Jonathan. Um, I mean, that you, you can get way further into it. You can get in further into the hypostatic union. You can get further into uh, the Trinity. You can get further into a lot of it, but that's the bottom line about that. And he says, there are many... There have been some leaders in the past that have discussed uh, discourses on how the Immaculate Conception of Jesus transpired that have led to rumors spread that we believe God. It got cut off here. Let's see. That God the Father, there it goes. God the Father came down and had physical intercourse with Mary. Yeah, that's not, but that's not what we were talking about. We were talking about Heavenly Mother. Like, we were talking about this idea of Heavenly Father and Heavenly Mother having intercourse to create all people, basically, I guess. I, I don't know how that works. But yeah, that's not what we were talking about. But the begotten thing was the big big part of that section because um, it doesn't mean creating. You don't create uh, something of your own substance. So, and begot, But to beget something means you bring forth something of your own substance. So there's a distinction there. Hope that clears that up. But we will see here in a minute that, uh, anyway, we'll get to it. So it says, no one thus far has claimed that Jesus was born of an earthly man. Not sure where that came from. Well, I'm not, that wasn't a claim towards uh, LDS, really. That was a clarification of, a lot of, a lot of, Evangelicals don't really understand why Jesus had to be born of the Holy Spirit and not like Joseph couldn't have been his father and he couldn't have just been anointed. Well, part part of it is he that was his way of being divine. That's how God did beget the human nature of Jesus uh, with divinity, but it also uh, puts him outside of the lineage of Adam. So it lets him be he. So Adam means man. Right, so Adam was supposed to be the epitome of a man made in God's image, and he failed at that. Right, well, Jesus is Paul refers to him as the second Adam in Romans five, and so what Jesus is is the next, uh, the next man who God didn't create from dirt. He he brought him forth from a woman. But he did breathe life into him himself without another man begetting him. God beget him, the man Jesus. So what that means is now that the first Adam failed, 
this we have now another atom okay we have another atom now the first atom was not beget by god the first atom was formed out of the dirt and god breathed life into him this next the second atom was begotten of god there's a distinction there as well but the second atom is the true Adam. He fulfilled what the first Adam failed. Okay? And that's why if you are in Christ, you there is now no condemnation, as Paul tells us in Romans 8. So there is condemnation if you're born to the first Adam. But there is now no condemnation if you are born again by the Spirit, spiritual rebirth to uh, in the lineage of the new, the second Adam and the true Adam, the one that fulfilled what the first Adam could. It's all beautiful. It all fits so well together, too. So that's what that was about. Um, so he says that, just to get to the next part of this, he says that he's not sure where that came from. He says the LDS uh, doctrine is that Pre-mortal, before being born in the flesh, Jesus is Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament, okay, who with the Father created the heavens and the earth, okay. Why do you think the book of Genesis uses the plural pronouns of the, in the creation, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness? In this sense, Jesus is God. In that sense, what does that mean? Like, only in that sense? Uh, has always been God and always will be God. So was he created or or was he, or is he God? And when, okay, Jonathan, this, what, uh, <laughs> you're talking about not understanding doctrines. Um, you're going to ask, why do you think the book of Genesis uses plural pronouns? Because of the Trinity, that's a that's a Trinitarian proof text, to not not meaning proof text in in the derogatory way. Let us make man in our image. That's the the persons of the Godhead, and you I know you like the word Godhead. We'll, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, I can I'm I'm good with using Godhead. It's in the Scripture. That's the three persons of the Godhead. In communion with each other. Let us make man in our image. And and I, I would agree, Jesus has always been God. <laughs> uh, but you're contradicting yourself here, Jonathan, because he's if he's created, he's not eternally God. So which is it? While God the Father is a creator of all of us premortally, he created all of us premortally, including Jehovah and Lucifer. So you just said that Jesus is God <laughs> eternally, always has been, but then he was created premortally. That you that doesn't that doesn't fly, Jonathan. That's not that's illogical. God you're saying God can create another God. So I guess that's where you get the many gods doctrines. I mean, bottom line is this. Uh, the, the scriptures tell us, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And then in Isaiah, uh, there is no other God before me or after me. Multiple times, 46 and Isaiah 44. In many other places, I am the only God, he says. So this is a monotheistic requirement of uh Christianity, but you have multiple gods. You just said that he created, somehow God created another God. Well, you just completely demolished what it means to be God. Because, But, okay, you're contradicting yourself, though, that Jesus is always God, but he was, he created Jehovah premortally. That makes no sense. But it if you do have um, many gods, as I think is the doctrine of the LDS, then it can make sense. So, 
yeah, I mean, I guess that can make sense, but it's it's just it's heretical to be honest with you, Jonathan. It's 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 dangerous heresy. And let's let's let me throw this one out there to you. Lucifer. Uh, Lucifer is not the name for the devil. And I'm going to, uh, in the, in the, and I'm going to drop a comment in, in this video. I'm going to drop a comment in this video that explains this. And this is from a brother, uh, Nick Campbell from, uh, Christ is the cure. And he lays out how Lucifer is not the name of the devil. And it actually means, I mean, it's, it's a very detailed thing. And that it actually uh, is referring to the morning star, which Jesus is also referred to as the morning star. Uh, Jesus could be called uh, Lucifer. So is Jesus Lucifer. And so anyway, that's something extra. I'm not going to get into that here, but I will put that in the comments of this video. It's very interesting. And I'll link to, I'll link to Nick's uh, very detailed description of that in that comment as well, or in the description here, I guess, or the comments, either way, or both. So, let's see, Jonathan says, duh, duh, duh. all right, uh, the Trinity, he says, the Trinity is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word Trinity is nowhere found in the Bible. Godhead is. This is the Godhead made up of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost, he says, because they are King James onlyist. Jesus himself debunks the idea of a trinity himself multiple times in John 17. Um, the Godhead is... the uh, Okay, Jonathan. The... I know that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is in the Book of Mormon. And and just saying that it's just called Godhead, it's not the Trinity, doesn't do anything. And and if you're gonna if your argument is that the word Trinity is not in the Bible, that is just elementary. That's an elementary fallacy. Because the word Trinity is just a word to describe what is given to us in the Bible, what we're confronted with, we're, we're confronted with a single God, one true God, but we are confronted with three persons. They're not three manifestations. That's, we're not, they're not three modes, not modalism. They're not three different beings. Okay? And Jesus is not created uh Jesus is not a separate of separate substance. The, the Son is begotten of the Father. He is, like we talked about earlier, He is of the same substance. That's Arianism to say otherwise. So, these, it's really simple, and it's not contradictory either. By the way, let's go to the law of contradic non contradiction. Some call it the law of contradiction. Typically, it's called the law of non-contradiction. Probably the, the probably the fundamental uh, law of logic, and what that says is this: it says that A can't be A and not A at the same time and in the same relationship. And there's nothing contradictory one about the hypostatic union, which is that Jesus is truly God, truly man, because He is not. God and not God, he's still God, fully, truly, and he's not man and not man, he's still man, truly, fully, and then for the Trinity, it's, it's the same thing. It's not that God is one and not one at the same time, because there is one being of God, one substance of God, one essence of God, and three persons in that essence and substance of God. Jonathan, you are a human, are you not? You're a human, okay? A man, I assume. You can only assume these days. You're a man, 
that's what you are. God is God, that's what he is. But you are a person, Jonathan, that's who you are, okay? God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that's who he is. We are one uh, what and one who. God is one what and three who's. And that's not contradictory. And that's one of the things that you hear, I've heard it multiple times from Mormons, is that it's illogical. That's not illogical. And it's not contradictory. He is not a God and not God at the same time in the same relationship. And he is not three persons and not three persons at the same time and in the same relationship. So it's not contradictory. It's he is what? He's God. He is who? He is the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. You are what? You're a man. You are who? You're Jonathan. Okay? It's not that. It's actually, I mean, it's, I don't want to say, it's not that complicated. The Trinity is one of the most complicated things for us to even consider. Because we only know one and one. We only know one man or one human and one person together. We don't have one human and multiple persons. Now, some people claim they have multiple persons within them. Some claim they have hundreds of persons within them. That's a whole nother story. Um, but that's actually not that contradictory, I guess. Although we consider that to be a mental illness. That's, don't, that's a, we shouldn't get off into that. All right, buddy. All right, so um, he says the Trinity is not in the Bible. Just because the word's not there don't mean anything, okay? Uh, Heavenly Mother's not in the Bible either, is she, Jonathan? Mm hmm Okay, we'll move on from that. I think I pretty much, I think I defended the Trinity um, clearly, uh, not perfectly, because it is complicated. Let's see, that's where the atonement begins, talking about the, the garden. The, he says the atonement begins in the garden. Um, uh, the course of resurrection, conquering death is what folks don't celebrate, but we remember his atonement and sacrifice every Sunday as he, we partake in the sacrament. Most of us don't wear a cross. Okay. He still didn't, uh, he still hasn't uh, described what atonement means to them. So I'm still not clear on that, not sure. But, uh, you know, we, we've, on this, on this, on our podcast, we've clearly articulated the atonement, uh, the, the Orthodox view of the atonement, uh, penal substitutionary atonement. The, uh, what the cross means. Uh, we've had multiple conversations about that so far. So uh, if you haven't listened to any of the podcasts, go listen to them. You'll, you'll hear that. Uh, he said, you'll never find any doctrine in the church that says you have to earn God's favor. There are principles and ordinances that Christ taught that you have to live by to become perfected in him. And, return to be with the Father again. I'm not sure why so many Christian fates just ignore these things. There it is. There it is. There it is. He denies, tries to, that um, that you can't earn God's favor, but you have to do all these things to be perfected in Him. Jonathan, that is the key, one of the core key distinctions between your religion that you are trapped in and the true gospel of Christ. Christ is the perfecter. The ordinance don't perfect anybody. Christ is the perfecter. We are seen as righteous as he by his works. That's This is the imputation, Jonathan. This is what's key. And you deny the imputation. And actually earlier, if we look back, you talked about uh, the merits He's mentioned the merits of Jesus somewhere. And if you really believe that, then you believe imputation. But you, this right here shows that you don't believe that you are, you are uh, redeemed to God by Christ's merits, by his work. 
you are not being perfected to be able to return to be with the Father. Christ did it. Jonathan, that's the key, man. If you can get that, you will have so much peace. I promise you. You can, you will, and you will properly glorify Christ and his works, and you'll properly glorify God in general. That's the gospel is for his glorification. And if it's about you conducting ordinances, um, then that's not glorifying to him. He's not glorified by you building up. He's glorified by his uh, upholding his promises to Abraham. Man, I wouldn't, Jonathan, I would encourage you. I mean, I appreciate you listening to this one. You know, I know it related to you, but I, I mean, I would challenge you, Jonathan, to listen to our other conversations about covenant theology, about biblical theology and the story of redemption throughout the whole Bible and how wonderful it is. And, uh, you know, heck, engage with, engage with us on that if you want to. But, you know, we're coming to a close here on this one, but that's the key, Jonathan. That's it. This is, he ended it with the key distinction here. That, that we are to conduct these ordinances so that we can become perfected. You're not perfected by what by your ordinances. That's what we're saying, Jonathan. That's why we're saying you're a works-based religion. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not do. It's done. It's not what you do. It's what he did. And it's a free gift of grace. And it's all for his glory. It's for the Son's glory, the Lamb who was slain, the one who's worthy to open the scroll in Revelation 5. Oh, Jonathan, I beg you to search the Scriptures, the Scriptures alone, the Bible, to see this from beginning to end, that God comes to us. We don't go to Him. He came to Adam and Eve. He covered Adam and Eve when they sinned. He told them they would die, and they didn't. He gave them grace. And not only that, he covered them. He killed an animal and covered them. Because they're measly, they're measly uh, vegetable uh, plant coverings, leaf coverings, couldn't do it. He did it. And then he told Abraham, I will provide. And he did, and Abraham believed him. And it was counted to him as righteousness. It was counted to him as Christ's righteousness to come. Romans 3, through the forbearance, Christ's righteousness was to show God, Christ's propitiation was to show God as righteous because he passed over former sins, including Abraham's sins, including everyone's sins before Christ because he knew that he was going to fulfill the covenant that he made with Abraham. And then in Isaac, And then in Joseph, they meant it for evil, but I meant it for good, he says. And for his glory. And then in David, the king. But Christ is the true king. Christ is the true Israel. He's the fulfillment of the whole scripture. Jonathan, here's the thing. If you believe that you are saved by Christ's merits alone, you don't need this religion. All you need is the grace of God through Christ and faith in that and trust that God, uh, that, that salvation belongs to the Lord. And that when Jesus said that the least in heaven is, is the greatest, that that means something. That means that the least in heaven is wearing the cloak of righteousness of Jesus Christ. They're not wearing the cloak of righteousness of their ordinance, their ordinances that they conducted. You or anyone else who is deceived by these false prophets and these false apostles in this damnable heresy I, I, I'm trying to be as gracious as possible, Jonathan, but this is serious. 
God does not share his glory with anyone. And his glory is the salvation through Jesus Christ. You are perfected only in Christ, not in anything you do. The, any, any one of us who thinks that we have any standing before God in any way, based on anything we do, we're in trouble. And you might be surprised to hear this, Jonathan, but this is not the perfect belief of every people, every person that claims they're a Christian, that claims they're even an evangelical Christian or a Baptist or Methodist or whatever. There are tons of people in the church today who don't get that. They still think they're good because what they've done, because they got baptized even. <laughs> there are people in the, in the evangelical church that think they're going to heaven because they got baptized. They think they're going to live with God in, in eternity because they got baptized. They're doing what you think, what you're talking about. I did the ordinance of baptism. I'm good. But they're not trusting their answer to the question of why are you here in in heaven or is or not they wouldn't be there so the, why are you going to heaven is not because Christ fulfilled all righteousness and he accounted that to me on the cross and I trust that and he resurrected to prove it that's not their answer their answer is because I, I try to do good and I got baptized and that's the same thing that you have and that they are both wrong whether they call themselves evangelical or whether they call themselves Mormon so, Jonathan, man, I appreciate you uh, engaging with us, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, try to try to uh, walk through this here. But uh, man, I hope it made sense. I hope uh, hope I was gracious. I tried to be not trying to be argumentative. I can be. I can be very snarky and polemical. Uh, but this is a uh, this is just a chance to try to lay out the core doctrines, and um, you know, call you to repentance. To be honest, you know, I lived a long time without truly repenting, so it's uh, it's not a shame. You know, everybody has to repent. We should humble ourselves in repentance, and solely trust on Christ's work, and believe that God will cloak us with the righteousness of Christ, dip, uh, bathed in the blood of the sacrifice. So, again, appreciate it. And uh, check out some of our other stuff. And if you want to respond to this, man, that'd be fun. Do it. We'll talk about it some more. But, uh, other folks that have uh, been checking out our listen to our podcast people from our church and everything we'll uh we're gonna keep trying to put them out jeremy and i try to come up with good stuff y'all give us some more questions and different things you want us to talk about maybe we'll be doing more of these videos going up responses we'll see but uh whoever watched this probably all one of you appreciate you see ya